we're not trying to cost you more money. And let me say that if we are costing you a few more dollars, then that's the price of doing business in the city of Cleveland so that people can feel a part of. Uh, right now, let's stay on that. Now, sure. there, there's a lot of people who feel that the cost of doing business in the city of Cleveland costs too damn much. And to give you that example, you look at some of the development that's going on the outskirts of Cleveland. Yeah. Every Amazon, big Amazon factory or warehousing or whatever they do, you look at them, they right on the outskirts of Cleveland. None of those are in the city of Cleveland. None of those bought any of those jobs into the city of Cleveland and that. So why do you think is that? Two reasons. Okay. And I'm glad that you asked that. And mm -hmm. when I say your price is doing business, let me say this to you. There's also a benefit to doing business in the city okay. of Cleveland. Just yeah, as yeah, much give me as that there's one. a yeah. price, okay. there's a benefit. Okay. Land is cheaper. Okay. The There are other benefits that you get for your bang for your buck. That you just say we it cost you to get it, right? Say that again? You said, but if those benefits, what are those benefits? Dude, I'm saying the benefits that is cheap. For example, you buy a house that's cheaper in Cleveland, or if you buy a plot of land, they're going to charge you more for the plot of land than some of these suburban communities. The taxes are higher in a lot of these that's places. Correct. A lot of the other amenities that you're looking for are closer in the city of Cleveland, mm -hmm. like the lakefront, like Severus Hall, like mm -hmm. the sports teams, like Playhouse Square. So a lot of people want to move here. Not to even mention, I was in Oakwood yesterday at a relative's mm -hmm. house. And I'm looking at there, the amount that you just spend in gas going back and forth to work. So there's a benefit to living in Cleveland, too, mm -hmm. as opposed to moving out to the suburbs. So Cleveland is a good place to do business and open to do business. Mm -hmm. But you asked the question, which we have two things that we've done into talking about why your Amazons and some of these big items are moving to these areas. One is the availability of land. Okay. Cleveland is hard to find parcels and mm. having site control for large parcels because we're a legacy city. Okay. And oftentimes you have to go in an area and you may have 10 different owners, whereas you go to some of these suburban areas, you only got to deal with one owner. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. Hey, what's up, everybody? You tuned in to another episode of Strategic Moves. I'm your host, Ken Dow. And this is a place where we bring art, culture, politics, and business all together. And we do it every Sunday right here on this channel. And when I'm not shooting this channel, I am the owner of Strategic Resources Consulting, where we specialize in political campaigns, government, and public relations work. Been doing it around this city and this state for over 25 years. To met some interesting people along the way, and I want to make your next move a strategic move. And this show gives me an opportunity to do just that. So today, I'm going to bring in one of my good friends, and he's going to come together, and we're going to talk about some of the issues that's been going on here in Cleveland. So I'm going to tell you this. It is hot as hell in this studio. Now, I'm going to introduce this brother because he got on a suit. He only got about 12 pieces on the day. <laughs> so he's got cool with his outfit today, but it's hot as hell in here. And he's going to talk about some of the hot topics that's going on here in Cleveland. We're not going to keep you long, and we're going to get right to it, and we're going to put him right in the hot seat. So everybody want to give a warm welcome to our council president, Mr. Blaine Griffin, in the house. What's up, Cam? Oh, everything's good, sir. I wanted to get an opportunity. Thank you for coming on our program today, man, because one is very hot, man. Is it, We're getting right into the summer of what's going on in Cleveland, and I will put this shout out that my air conditioner in this building does not work. Oh, wow. That's why it's happening here, man. You got okay. all these damn fans around here, man, because this <laughs> damn building, it looks nice on the outside, but I'm telling you, man, inside this joint, it is racist. <laughs> oh, so we're going to do what we have to do to try to stay cool this thing, and we may end up bringing a more the fan in here and turning others on may have some audio difficulties but we're going to get through it so today we got council president blaine griffin blaine won't you tell us a little bit about what's going on and what's been going on with you lately since the last time you've been on the show last time it was back in we was just getting started right yeah, and Ken, it's always an honor and a pleasure to be here. There's never a dull moment in the mm -hmm. city of Cleveland. Oh, yeah. A lot of things are happening. A lot of exciting things are happening mm -hmm. in the city of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I always tell people my first job is to be the council person for Ward 6. Okay. So being the council person for Ward 6, we have some very exciting developments. Mm -hmm. uh, in October of this year, we're scheduled to open a new supermarket at 105th and Cedar. We have very good plans on developing housing and affordable housing and market rate housing throughout the ward. Mm -hmm. uh, we're continuing with quality of life issues. The bread and butter of council politics is what we do in the summer. Mm -hmm. Even though we're on recess, this is actually the hardest time of year. Right. And you rarely see me in the suit right. during this time of year. Right. I just had several meetings, one with the illustrious congresswoman earlier today, mm -hmm. and I had to dress the part. 
Okay. Uh, but this is the time of year we're out in the neighborhoods mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we're out there touching people, hearing people's concerns and really being available. Uh, your best ability in this business is your availability. Mm -hmm. But Ward 6 is going great. Cleveland City Council as council president is my mm -hmm. second job. Mm -hmm. That's going well. We really are gelling as a council, mm -hmm. uh, getting to know each other's personalities. And we have some very sharp people. And we've been pushing some very good policies, man, that I hope we get a chance to talk about on your show today. Yeah, one of them that we're going to really jump into right away, because like I said, it's hot and we're going to keep it moving in keep here. Moving. We're going to talk about the last week, I think it was, I had an opportunity to come down to city council and you guys did a press conference on the CBO, which is a collective bargaining agreement. And for the people out there who don't know what a collective bargaining agreement means and what that means for the city and the average person, Blaine, why don't you, council president, why don't you tell us and explain to everybody what that is? We had what's called a community benefits ordinance. Ah, that's okay? what it is. Okay. And it's called a CBO, the community mm -hmm. benefits ordinance. Okay. Codified what was originally put in place approximately 10 years ago mm -hmm. when former mayor Frank Jackson got a group of leaders together from different industries and said, let's do a memorandum of understanding in order to try to provide more equity in diversity in construction trades and mm -hmm. all of the things that we we're doing. That one was housed by the Greater Cleveland Partnership. And what we did is a Community Benefits 2.0. We okay. codified it okay. and actually improved it to make sure that we improved more accountability, more data collection, more transparency. Basically, what we're trying to do is anytime you get a financial incentive uh, from the city of Cleveland, whether it be tax abatements, whether it be tax incremental financing, mm -hmm. where you take a portion of the taxes that you used to pay and would have to plow it into the financing of the project, uh, and then we also do things like grants, loans, land swaps. All of those different things are financial incentives that we provide into developers mm -hmm. in order to grow our economy, mm -hmm. as well as to try to Let's make sure, as well as to try to make sure that we provide job creation. Okay. And because of that, we wanted to codify a community benefits ordinance, and it's quite simple. Is because in about four, about from the years 2014 to the 2018, only 4.62% of the $1.1 billion in prime contracts, mm. only 4.62% mm. have gone to minority business enterprises, female business enterprises, and Cleveland small businesses, which means that we're not doing equity. When you got a city that's, when you look at about 48 to 49% African-American, mm -hmm. another 12% Hispanic, mm -hmm. and then you also have about another 2% Asian-American, mm -hmm. we're not being equitable in mm -hmm. making sure that we're providing opportunities mm -hmm. for the people in this city. So we're doing this to make sure that people in this city see a return on their investment. Whenever we put taxpayer dollars on the table, we want developers to say, here's what our commitment is going to be to the city of Cleveland. But having these type of programs exist before, the Fannie Lewis Law and some of these other, what's the difference, the difference in that? The difference is this hit and miss, okay? Mm -hmm. Fannie Lewis Law used to be required, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, basically, these are agreements that people agree to do. And that the developer, if you're the developer and you're developing a complex in the neighborhood, you're basically saying, here's what I'm going to do to benefit the community. For example, some of the teams put money into sports, like Muni League football. Uh, even though we, we, we have basketball teams that we put financial incentives to, they redo courts. They do other kind of job creation things. They make sure that they have different percentages, which right now is 15% uh, minority business enterprise percent uh, female business enterprise and seven percent Cleveland small business enterprise. So these basically are them saying in order to get the incentive that we want to do, here's what you here's what you need to do. So the difference is before you said the Fannie Lewis law was a law that required it was required. So basically it said in order to get this, you have to do X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Now you're basically saying the same thing, but we're saying, okay, you are going to agree to do this. And if you don't, then council has the opportunity to say, oh, if we want to provide, if we want to vote for the incentive for you or not. They, so they give them the incentive yeah. that they're looking and for. And that's now. why we, we want to try so to make sure that that's why there. you say you hope, uh, to most part, it's an agreeable thing where they agree to do it so that it's not a at the table discussion about arguing whether or not you guys are going to do that. So in, in saying that, 
how does the average person benefit from that? Yeah, well, average citizen. I actually started thinking about this when there were several homes being built on the street. And one of the street club presidents and folks came to me, I'll never forget this, on Shell Avenue. They said, Councilman, this is great, but you're building new houses and we haven't had curbs. Mm -hmm. Or you're building these new houses and Miss Jones, who's been living here since 1975, hasn't had a paint job because she can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I started talking to developers to say, hey, how is the broader community going to benefit when you come and build these developments and build these kind of structures in our neighborhoods? So one of the things that's a part of this is mandatory community engagement. There has never been a uniform process that we are putting in place in order for you to have to engage the community. A lot of times people just wake up and people just start building in those communities and they don't even talk to the community, mm -hmm. see what the community feels about some of these projects. Now, that's not the only indicator, but that's one of the indicators that we look at. So everybody, we want to do this so that everybody could benefit and that Clevelanders could see themselves in these projects. We want to do something meaningful, measurable, and fair. So when a developer, and I'm playing devil's advocate, that's why we got this thing, good podcast if I'm only on Blaine's side, right? <laughs> so let's talk about that. As a developer, does it cost me any more money? It is, if I'm coming to the city and the city is going to give me a tax abatement for a million dollars and you say you're going to give me this, but I still got to go spend this million dollars, should I just spend the million dollars in the first place and didn't ask for the incentive? That could be the case. Mm -hmm. And I've had developers that say, hey, why are these developers coming and asking you for money? Mm -hmm. Developers have said that to them, mm -hmm. saying, hey, this should be a free market opportunity. I mm -hmm. believe in providing these. And what, what you mean by that? Some developers feel like, hey, just make them stand on their own merit and make sure that they, they can, shouldn't instead ask of any, asking the for city anything. for incentives, mm -hmm. if you really have a strong financial incentive package, you need to put, you need to just move forward. Now, this is the developer saying this. Mm -hmm. The developers that I talk to always say, in order for the project to pencil in, and for it to line up the right way and for right. them to recoup their costs, they need these kind of incentives in order to make the project work. Now, let me give you an example. Okay. If I'm building a $300,000 house mm -hmm. in the city of Cleveland, mm -hmm. that same $300,000 house costs me the same because of materials, permitting, architectural designs. Maybe even cost me more in the city of Cleveland if we got to do cleanup. For God forbid, we got to dig up one of those foundations that back in the day they mm -hmm. buried in the ground. Mm -hmm. May even cost us more. So because of that, there's a gap. And because there's often a gap when you build it in one of these suburban communities like Solon, and then the appraisal value that you get in Solon may be mm -hmm. worth $450,000. I'm just giving mm -hmm. the number out mm -hmm. here, throwing it out mm -hmm. there. Don't, be, don't believe the science. But then in the city of Cleveland, your appraisal value may only be Two hundred and fifty thousand, which means you got about a fifty thousand dollar gap if the house costs you three hundred thousand dollars to build, whereas your value is increasing in some of these well-to-do neighborhoods in Cleveland decreases sometimes. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you need incentives to close that gap, correct, in order to get your financing across. So I'm not against that. I just think like any other investor. Any other member that's putting into your project, I want to see how we're going to get our money back. And I want to see how the community is going to benefit either through jobs, physical infrastructure. It could be money going into an affordable housing fund. We know we got a problem but there. Rehabilitation, etc. But doesn't so, the city quick, does? It doesn't cost you more money. All right. Basically, is basically you, a lot of developers build that into their cost in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are telling people. We're not trying to cost you more money. And let me say that if we are costing you a few more dollars, then that's the price of doing business in the city of Cleveland so that people can feel a part oh, of it. Right now, let's stay on that now. Sure. There, there's a lot of people who feel that the cost of doing business in the city of Cleveland costs too damn much. And I'll give you that example, you look at some of the development that's going on the outskirts of Cleveland. Yeah. Every Amazon, big Amazon factory or warehousing or whatever they do, you look at them, they right on the outskirts of Cleveland. None of those are in the city of Cleveland. None of those bought any of those jobs into the city of Cleveland and that. So why do you think is that? Two reasons. Okay. And I'm glad that you asked that. And mm -hmm. when I say the price of doing business, let me say this to you. There's also a benefit to doing business in the city okay. of Cleveland. Just yeah, as yeah, much as there's one. a yeah. price, okay. there's a benefit. Okay. Land is cheaper. Okay. The There are other benefits that you get for 
You're bang for your buck. That you just said it clear. cost you to get, right? Say that again? You said, but if those benefits, what are those benefits? Good, I'm saying the benefits that is cheap. For example, you buy a house that's cheaper in Cleveland, or if you buy a plot of land, they're going to charge you more for the plot of land than some of these suburban communities. The taxes are higher in a lot of these that's places. That's correct. A lot of the other amenities that you're looking for are closer in the city of Cleveland, mm -hmm. like the lakefront, like Severus Hall, like mm -hmm. the sports teams, like Playhouse Square. So a lot of people want to move here. Not to even mention, I was in Oakwood yesterday at a relative's house, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at there, the amount that you just spend in gas going back and forth to work. So there's a benefit to living in Cleveland too, mm -hmm. as opposed to moving out to the suburbs. So Cleveland is a good place to do business and open to do business. Mm -hmm. But you asked the question, which we have two things that we've done into talking about why your Amazons and some of these big items are moving to these areas. One is the availability of land. Okay. Cleveland is hard to find parcels and mm. having site control for large parcels because we're a legacy city. Okay. And oftentimes you have to go in an area and you may have 10 different owners, whereas you go to some of these suburban areas, you only got to deal with one owner. That's what you mean by legacy? Legacy means that because we've been here for so long and when we started doing these kind of deals, you might have an area like, let's say, on 105th and St. Clair, <laughs> that if you're doing a development over there or 105th and Superior, you might have to deal with 10 owners in a you. parcel I got you. that's been here for a I long understand. time. That's legacy owner. Okay. When you're in the suburban areas, <laughs> we have to deal with one, one partner. Two, we, we're dealing with Brownfield in okay. Cleveland because mm -hmm. of the factories and because of mm -hmm. how some of the houses were built mm -hmm. and because of some of the environmental hazards. You have to deal with significant Brownfield cleanup. Mm -hmm. We've just challenged that and fought that by, one, working with creating a sites fund for $50 million in ARPA money so that we can clear and clean big sites mm -hmm. in order to be able to compete for some of these other big ticket items like Intel got mm -hmm. down in Columbus. Now, Intel's problem is this. When you go down to Intel in Columbus, they got an affordable housing problem. They have the land to build the factory, but they don't have the infrastructure and the workers that can live around the area. So that's they're right. dealing with a huge housing crisis mm -hmm. that's going to be able to support that. We don't have that issue. Our problem is mm -hmm. site control, having been able to have large enough acres you need sometimes 25 acres of site mm. control That's correct. and brownfield remediation, mm. which we're working with the state to really try to make sure we could clean up some of these brownfield sites. All right. So I'm getting you close. You almost got a few more minutes on this one. So I'm going to hit you with this one. The new legislation or the new laws that was passed by the Supreme Court recently about what was going on in colleges and getting rid of the affirmative action. How do you see coming down the road that might affect what you did with this? New ordinance that you never know with the legal side. Mm -hmm. People always try to put lawsuits in place like that. But I told everybody, we also reserve the right to vote no. That's so correct. we are not mandated to mm -hmm. vote for anything other than tax abatement, That's which correct. by state law is a standalone, mm -hmm. which Cleveland is one of the few, or the state of Ohio is one of the few states that has tax abatement by. Other than that, we don't have to support TIFs, mm -hmm. don't have to support some of these That's other correct. tools. Right. So it's a matter of you mm -hmm. coming to this council saying, here's how your community is going to benefit from this deal. And when we are dealing with these issues, that's how we look at it. So they may have court cases, but I don't think affirmative action will deal with this directly. But it is a devastating blow for all of the cases that they did in Supreme Court that I think that they are tone deaf, in my opinion, yeah. and really did a disservice to us with all of the cases that they really put forth last week. Well, that's a good segment for us to go into the next thing we want to talk about. And that's this new thing that they're about to put on the ballot. They're out there getting signatures now because there's a group of people here in Cleveland who feel that they want to have a say in what you guys spend down there in city council and what the council and the mayor spend as it relates to the budget. Give us some information and some insight on that, Blaine, if you don't mind. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think you might be talking about participatory budgeting. That is exactly what we're talking about. We're okay. putting it on the clock right now. Let participatory budgeting. That. Let me is say on that. the clock. Uh, I do not support participatory budgeting. I have not supported participatory budget since its onset when originally they wanted $30 million. Then they wanted $5 million of ARPA money, American Rescue Plan Act dollars. Then their most recent proposal that they're trying to mess with is trying to get as much as, in increments, $14.7 million. Now, so before we jump into it, because me and you know what that is, Blaine, you got to explain to the people because everybody don't know people. what the heck is participatory what budget. What they would like to do is they would like to create a steering committee. First of all, they want to adjust the charter. 
And okay. we got to be very careful when we start tinkering with the charter. Charter amendments are not something to be taken lightly. That's like People our constitution. To, that's our constitution. You right. don't just start tinkering with the with the charter because once it's embedded in the charter, it's really difficult to overturn. And we need to be careful when we go down these different paths. Now, what they want to create is they want to create a process where they create a steering committee and they create a process where people from the neighborhood can come in and vote on what they would like to see, projects that they would like to see funded in their area. We already have a process that does that. It's called representative democracy. And that's what you elect 17 people and a mayor, 18 elected officials in the city of Cleveland to be able to engage the citizens and be able to make decisions based on those that input that you get from the citizens. And I can tell you right now what these guys with participatory budgeting would like to create. They're putting it as, oh, this is democracy and you can Dow or you, Mrs. Jones, or you, Mr. Smith, get a chance to make decisions on where your tax dollars go. Now, Ken, I can tell you that I have 17 members of council and it's difficult to herd all of us to make decisions. Could you imagine giving $300,000, which is the approximate amount that they would give towards the, each district? Mm. If I see in the latest proposal or award and have people from Little Italy all the way to East 93rd, all the way to Fairfax, all the way to Buckeye, come together and get in the room and have a democratic process to say how you want to spend this amount of money. So it costs so, more than that to do one street. So let's just go into this thing. So are they saying that they want to have council representation in each of the war? Um, and I ain't going to call it council. Council member? Shadow or, government. It, it's shadow government, it's right? It's another it's layer of government. It's another layer of bureaucracy. And let me say this. They, they haven't gotten the signatures yet, uh, so I'm not sure if this is even going to be on the ballot. And let me say this. I always welcome debates and conversations on how our government can better serve people. So the people that's a part of this, I don't demonize them. I don't think that they're bad people. I just think that when you're talking about taking $14.7 million to go through this community process or as low as 10 or 5, then it costs approximately $1.7 million to hire 10 police officers. So think about that. Do the math. It costs $14 million to just run the building and housing department. So think about that. Do the map. You're going to have to take away some kind of city for, in to, order to, to try to do accommodate what they do. this another layer of bureaucracy so, so, that's going to put a process so. that, quite frankly, I don't think is going to be equitable because the people with the more time on their hands and the people that's coming from affluent communities will have more say, more involvement than that single mother that has to work two or three jobs or that elderly person that can't get out to the meetings. And what's going to happen? A small group of people then control the process and they're doing it under the name of democracy. But as the end of the day, these are people who should be more involved with electing who they think can serve their community well. What about the ones who say, man, I want my voice heard? There's a group of people in there. This is why this is all about, because they feel as if their voice is not being heard. That's another reason why I cannot support it, because I have approximately 75 people. Your beautiful daughter came to a meeting mm -hmm. and spoke to our meeting approximately two months ago. Mm -hmm. We have a packed house every week. Mm -hmm. And I go live on podcasts on, mm -hmm. on Facebook. And I'm honest and I talk to everybody and open up ideas for everybody. When we did ARPA dollars, and this is when we were doing COVID, I actually held Zoom meetings and had more than 150 people in the ward in attendance saying how they would like to see the dollar spent, which is what guided my priorities. You're not a good council person if you're not engaged with the public. I have eight distinct communities with eight distinct needs. And it's no way that you could do this equitably because I'm going to tell you inevitably there's going to be somebody or somewhere that's going to be left out. And we already have a process. Make your elected what is officials the process? do better. What's the process? I meet and talk with people every day. I get input. We put surveys out. We mm -hmm. put messages out. During, I have more than 2,500 people in my database that I get input back from on a regular mm -hmm. basis. We have council meetings where we go through these processes, where we have several committees. Most pieces of legislation go through three different hearings before they become law. We also have, by law, community development block grant dollars where the community is supposed to come and give input. So oh, you yeah. said that. That's still yeah. that point. Because I want to make sure that yeah. I capture this. When I have 100 people coming or 75 to 100 people coming every month for the last six years and been loyal and working on bettering their community, now I got to pay a group of people who won't come to these settings 
because, oh, we can't come in and dominate the meeting because I don't let people dominate my meeting. Mm -hmm. I make sure that the residents who are there mm -hmm. engage, have a voice. Then there are people that have a voice. It's just people who, it's a difference from wanting your voice heard to wanting your voice to override right. what the council person right. and what the majority well, says they want to do. Your voice being heard versus somebody doing what you want them to do. Exactly. It, it's two different things. Yeah. Now, and if we don't do what we want what you to you do, do now, then you, your job is to go and try to figure out if you want to vote us out. And listen, mm -hmm. I tell people this, and I'm not saying this to be arrogant or cocky, but this is a democracy. If people don't think I'm doing my job, they have a right to vote me out. Take me out. I'll go do something else. So if the average citizen had an opportunity or had an idea, and, and when we talk about this group that's talking about coming together, the type of projects are they talking about? Are they talking about fixing streets or are they talking about pet projects? Hey, we want you to fund this project over here that's going to do X, Y, and Z. What kind of authority are they talking about? They don't define it. And that's where this steering committee will pretty much be almost another government body or another layer of bureaucracy that would determine some of that. That's crazy. And at the end of the day, yes. And at the <laughs> end of the day, they're selling people on this, your voice and your, mm -hmm. your ideas will be done. I can tell you just this morning, just today, I've had two requests for streets to get repaved. I only get six streets mm -hmm. that I can do in all of that footprint that I told you that I can do in Ward 6 every year. Mm -hmm. Six streets. Mm -hmm. So I have to be very strategic on trying to do F-graded streets. I have to use data. I have to make sure I get right. input. I have to strategically make decisions. I have to hear from all of these mm -hmm. different folks and prior to rise where it needs to go. So at the end of the day, if you're doing your job as a council person, you are listening to folks. I had another group that says they want speed bumps. And then right. another group said that they want to get more houses torn down. Mm -hmm. So there's always competing priorities. And what we try to do is invest in those competing priorities by listening to what people tell us what is critical and important to their neighborhoods and trying to deliver hits why we did the community benefits ordinance because people said, man, we see all of these different projects, but we don't see us. Mm -hmm. We don't see us being able to work on these projects. We don't mm -hmm. see us being able to buy these products. We don't see us getting any kind of community improvements for this. Mm -hmm. So that's when you listen to people and you act because you hear what the people are saying. I stay close with people. Mm -hmm. I can't speak for everybody, but most council people have a process that they really engage and every process is unique. Because I can tell you the people of Little Italy, because of their enclave and they don't come over often and it's a large mm -hmm. rural population, they don't always come over to East 93rd and Buckeye or East or Wood Hill and Buckeye to my community meetings. Mm -hmm. I got to go there too. I got to walk door to door in Slavic Village and Regent Park area to make sure that people say, hey, what is, what's going on? What's your needs? Mm -hmm. Make those investments. And then also, Ken, I've talked to other council presidents because I really tried hard to understand how this works and if they're in the other cities where this has worked. Every council president I talked to from Boston to Newark, New Jersey, to the West Coast have said that this has been a disaster and that they would not recommend it because, quite frankly, it's being sold one way. But then when you try to operationalize it, it turns out into a debacle. Hence, while we're watching some of the turmoil and struggles that we're seeing with the police commission that I hope they're successful, but we're seeing that because there's more towards governing and just thinking, oh, I can do that till you get in that room and you actually have to come to a consensus. Well, yeah, that, 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 that was the last big thing, the last big argument and fights that went on in that. Now we have a situation where you got a police committee that needs the damn police to come to the meeting to do security exactly. about them exactly. securing the public. Yeah, I so mean, it was really ridiculous. sad. It was a really sad commentary. And now let me say this. I'm not picking with them the most People on that committee are well-meaning people that just mm -hmm. want good police reform. The people of this city voted for that. So we complied. We gave our three. We support them with budgetary. But we also recognize that our fiduciary responsibility and our oversight responsibility still gives council a significant role to try to make sure that we have a proper decorum and a proper mm -hmm. administration of government in mm -hmm. the city of Cleveland. And creating all of these citizens panels sound great mm -hmm. that we're empowering people, getting more people involved. But then what they turn into, Ken, unfortunately, is a small minority of people that feel like they cannot have the platform that we have and therefore try to create, try to demonize our platform and create a different platform so that they can actually magnify their voices. And to me, that's just moving the deck chairs. That's yeah. not really trying to get to the core of the problem. Most of it is because these are heavy issues that they're asking to take on. And they are part-time positions. You sit on the board, 
uh, and all of that. You on this board, you come home from work having a hard day at work and probably having a hard day at dealing with some stuff you got to deal with at home. Now I got to come sit here for two hours to sit on this board and here comes somebody in off the street who have an issue. Now I got an issue and everything over and it carries over. I got to say this too, because this is important. There's a level of transparency, ethical accountability that every elected official has to follow now. Correct. The PB structure as it stands is highly corruptible. Correct. Somebody with the right business acumen Mm -hmm. or somebody that can come in and spread the right money around Mm -hmm. because they're not bound by some of the same rules of engagement. Correct. We got to also be very careful about being transparent as government. I am super transparent. I try to make sure that everybody knows everything that I'm doing, and that's why I explain every decision that I am. Even if people disagree with me or I disagree with somebody, I still spend the time to defend my position and help them understand my position because, to me, it's about making sure that I'm transparent. So you know what? We're going to keep it moving because we we gave them enough energy Sounds on, like a on theirs. And, we, I wanna, and they're not on the ballot yet. And so. they're not on the ballot. So we done gave them enough energy. And let's stay on something, though, on, on the point of these committees. Because you do have that consent decree that is committee that's coming up and the committee that did just have all the big fiasco that took place. And it's hot, as we said. And this weekend, lots of shootings, lots of killings. I think a few killings this weekend and lots of shootings and a lot of people got hurt this weekend. What is going on as it relates to that, Blaine? Give us some idea of what's what from what you can tell us what's happening uh, as it relates to this safety issue that's going on in our city and these committees. And are they worth it and are they really working to help us combat any of this stuff that's going on? Ken, that's a loaded question, and I'm going to answer it in a loaded answer. First of all, my condolences go out to the families of these folks that were murdered and also the folks that were wounded. When you become a victim of these kind of crimes, it's what keeps me up at night. It's what really keeps me up at night. Not some of these other things we talk about. Mm-hmm. Is how can we really deal with the violence of this city? I now, also, you dealt with that for some years, for with, years. with going firsthand, being first on know the spot these folks, with that. So I can I know. tell you all the right. stories. I've been in the rooms with mm-hmm. babies, with mothers that held six-month-year-old babies that were murdered, like Nevaeh, who mm-hmm. I'll never forget being in that room with that mother who mm-hmm. couldn't let that baby go, like a Stevie mm-hmm. Cookie Thomas and mm-hmm. some of these folks where I become close with their parents throughout mm-hmm. the year. And yes, people that were victims of police-involved shootings, people that I speak very highly of is a lady named Alicia Kirkman, mm-hmm. whose son was killed and was, was shot in a police-involved shooting. So I definitely understand the, the desperation, the depression, and the trauma this causes our community. I do want to say this. I just come from Ireland and in their most populous city, which is Dublin, and I forget, millions of people live in this city. They only have 17 officers that are commissioned to carry guns. They have next to no gun crimes, if any at all. Mm -hmm. Got a gun crime problem in this city. I'm a strong believer in the Second Amendment. Don't take that away. I do believe in responsible gun ownership. I also think that we have a huge problem with mental health in our community. And anytime that you shoot into a crowd of people or you shoot into a group of people that you know that there's women and children and elderly and others, and you go into safe places and you're so out of control, either because of you're intoxicated or you have mental health issues, then we got to deal with some of those issues, which are the root causes of why we're seeing some of the violence in our community. Other countries are doing it. We got to be better in the United States of doing it. And it's a cultural problem. We need the streets Mm -hmm. to say, for example, we opened up a rec center yesterday over at Stella Walsh in the Slavic Village area where a new basketball court was done from LeBron James and more than a game movie. Mm -hmm. They renovated an entire court. Man, a bunch of beautiful young people there. We need the streets to say, you know what? That's off limits. That's how me and you grew up, Mm -hmm. where the players were the ones who were involved with the back and forth. But civilians, people that weren't involved, didn't become victims. I am starting to see, because of this impulsiveness, that more and more innocent bystanders are being shot because people have mental health issues and other traumatic and adverse childhood experiences, which is called ACEs. And if we don't start addressing those, we're going to continue to have a gun problem in the city of Cleveland. And we need more local control. So is a lot of these crimes that you're getting with guns, are they, I was talking to an officer and he was saying that a lot of these crimes we're getting now or shootings are 
just impulsive, like impulsive. people arguing and an argument where they used to argue. He said, that's what his word was. He said, people can't even argue no more. He yeah. said, when they get in an argument, somebody pull out a gun and they shoot them. Most of the time, it's not like somebody who has a crazy record or somebody who's just violent. They just had a weapon, got in an argument, pulled out a gun and end up shooting somebody. So we getting a lot of that these days or, and that kind of thing, huh? A lot of that is interpersonal. A lot of these people that are shooting each other are friends that was mm. playing a video game or at a cookout, mm. having a drink with each other the night before. And then the next day they fall out over something very frivolous. Mm. And you're right. It's because of arguments. I also would tell you that most crime is not done by dope boys hanging out on the corner. Mm. Most of the feuds and most of the arguments are on these devices. Really? And because there's so much privacy issues and other things, it's hard to really pick up on those because you can have something that leave out on social media and you have a dispute on social media. All of a sudden it spirals out of control. All of our friends, then all of Cleveland see it. And the next thing you know, that's it. it's all. That's it. And if yeah. we don't start to get in a place to intercede with some of those things and deal with that. Plus, we got to be very innovative. Whenever we see hospitals and these folks that go to hospitals with gunshot wounds, <laughs> statistics show that within five years, they will either be the perpetrator or victim again really? of gun violence. And the statistics show that. So if we got people going to these hospitals, we should do things like work with Dr. Barksdale, who's the head pediatric surgeon at University Hospitals, where he basically has an anti-fragility program. When, when those, once those people are in the hospital, then let's try to put that wrap around with them and their family, because traditionally those are the folks going back out committing gun crimes. And another thing that we got to do is we put so much on police, but we need the adult parole to authority to step up and do mm -hmm. more visits on the people on parole. If you look at most of the people that are doing these gun crimes are people who shouldn't be having guns in the first place mm -hmm. and people who have very loose oversight when it comes to their parole or their probation and post prison release. We need to make sure that we have a close knit monitoring system on some of those folks as well. And we got to do better with technology in order to try to inter intervene in some of these things before they've been out of control. Mayor Bibb believed that the justice system itself, the judges, should be doing more to try to get them in there and to keep people in there longer and that thing. And what's your thoughts on that process? Not that we're picking on him and any of that. I just, the process as far as the jail itself and these guys, you think they're, the, they should do more to do stronger sentencing or more to try to get these guys who are committing these crimes? Because I think everybody is innocent to proven guilty. So the fact that you arrest me and make it harder for me to get, that ain't what I'm looking for. I think if you can get out, you can get out. That's not my issue. But I think there's people who are committing some serious crimes out here that seems to be just like you just mentioned. It's like on a revolving door, man, and just keep going round and round in these circles. And they don't get really caught until they do something that's totally heinous. And then it makes the news or then it makes it like, oh, we have to throw it away the key on this guy. Tough on crime hasn't worked. OK. The war on drugs has not worked. That hasn't worked. All of these things that people have tried to legislate and push have not always worked. OK. I don't want to make a blanket statement to mm -hmm. say, oh, all of these guys are getting out too soon because Mm -hmm. I think no, that's it's what a I'm matter saying. of judge. Yeah, because yeah. we had a brother yeah. who had a housing violation who spent a lot of yeah, time in jail. Yeah, and I would tell you that, <laughs> right. that each judge is different, different, so it's that's hard correct. to make a blanket that's statement. Correct. That's correct. There are some cases where some judges, mm -hmm. I think, are very lenient, but correct. I don't know what are the circumstances of that mm -hmm. post-release control. That's correct. It might be that they agreed to sign up for mental health, and then mm -hmm. once they got out there, they, dark, yeah, right. and they went somewhere and got mm -hmm. off of somebody's radar screen. It might be that this person really had the right kind of support system in place and then something happened, the mother passed away, wife left them, children won't talk to them or abandon them, that made them click or go off or whatever else. So every case is different. So I don't like to make blanket statements and I don't like to get into this, oh, just put people in jail whenever they do that because they, because I'll be honest with you, some of the times I lost my temper could have got me in trouble. And had it not been for me looking at mindfulness and some other things like that, I'll still be cussing and fighting because, mm -hmm. quite frankly, these people get on my nerves every mm -hmm. day. But I sit back and I use focus, control, and mm -hmm. patience, mm -hmm. and I always try to self-check myself. Mm -hmm. But you don't have everybody that has that level of control and self-discipline. And you never know what is going on with somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Those judges' job is to look at the entire picture. 
not just do what society wants them to do and throw some of these people away. Because I will tell you that in the past, I've used statistical analysis to find out that less than 4% of our population is responsible for an overwhelming amount of the gun crime in our city. Mm -hmm. The statistics that I had a few years ago, even though the report is dated, but in approximately 2014 to 15, I used to bring in the University of Cincinnati and they did statistical analysis. And we showed that 62 loosely affiliated groups were responsible for 663 of the shootings in the city of Cleveland, which represented about 4% of the total population of the city of Cleveland at the time. And the reason why that's important is because if we have a laser light focus on those folks and offer them mental health opportunities at employment, mentoring, check-ins, all of those different things that we can give them a good offense, but then also make it clear that we got a good defense, that if you do step out of line, not only are we going to crack down on you, but we're going to crack down on anybody affiliated with you because we know that you guys are responsible for an over amount of uh, over over a large amount of the shootings in our city, we got to be very strategic and use intelligence led policing as we approach these things, and not just play whack a mole and just try exactly. to figure stuff out. Is it safe to say? Is it safe to say that the system is? I don't want to say let people down, or people just fed up with the system. And when I say fed up with the system, I believe that the processes and everything you mention is there but we don't have the people to do it. We don't have enough police officers to do what the police need to do to help us stay safe. We don't have enough firemen. We don't have enough EMS workers. We, and this is not a slight to no. this is just reality. Not enough EMS, not a, enough social workers, not enough people to evaluate the probation officers down to what you're saying, to, to be able to follow up with the guys because they probably got stacks of people walking in their door like this with cases. Is it that's blame? We just the system is there, but we just don't have the workforce. And why we don't have the workforce? You bring up very, something very important, and I'll tell you a story behind it. I was once talking to a police, a former police chief in Oakland, California, and he said that he was having lunch with a Black Panther, and I was like, "That's an odd mix, police officer and a Black Panther." And he said the Black Panther told him something that really opened up his eyes. He said the Black Panther told him that. I, he didn't have a problem with police. He didn't have a problem with police. He had a problem with the system. But the only representative that the community seen on a regular basis that represented that system were the police. Okay. To your point, people have a problem with the system. Okay. And the remnants of the system have been inconsistent at best, especially for people of color, to defend, protect, and mobilize and mm. motivate us the right way. So yes, the system is on trial right now. And there are a group of people, as well as young people especially, that believe that the system should just crash oh, and yeah. we should do it all over yeah. again. Yeah. But what they got to be careful about yeah. is that change is a process and not an event. And change is like trying to turn around a major freighter in the middle of Lake Erie. You don't just do it overnight. And some of these guardrails in the system were put in place to protect people from abuse and other things. That's correct. So we got to do a little bit of both innovation, but also be old school and make sure that we don't just dismantle these guardrails that people spent yes. deck building in order for us to be successful. Mm -hmm. I will tell you this, the system has let me and you down. That's right. And this whole thing about American exceptionalism, mm -hmm. I know your story, you know my story. Mm -hmm. We made it despite the odds. Correct. So this whole thing about American exceptionalism, I think is a, a fairy tale and a false story because everybody had some help. That's correct. And usually the system is what helped a lot of us. The system don't always see themselves as the help as much as they see themselves as the oppressor. And that's what we got to try to figure out is how do we make the systems help make our community better and not be seen or assumed or the reality of being the oppressors. You know what, Blay? Actually, I'm going to tell you now, if there's some people out there listening, you gave them the strategic tip because that's what we hear. We give our strategic tip. That was a strong strategic tip on the beginnings of what needs to change in our process of how we interact with each other or start to change what's going on in the city. because. Everything that we need, the system has, and everybody is mad at the system, as you said, and don't want to be a part of it. And to that point, 
that's where we fell in at all of those things. I looked at the EMS thing and they talking about Ed Gallagher chasing my man oh, he on his butt on that EMS and everything. I hear him on that. And I heard the cries of that lady on my old street, Kempton. They did a thing and she was on Kempton crying, calling EMS, so, man. I was that, so sad about Yeah, that was sad, man. It reminded me that could be anybody's grandmother or any of our wives or any of that. Anybody just scared. That was a sound of terror. But the people were just not there. And it ain't that the city is doing anything bad. It ain't like we got people saying, you better not be EMS. You better not join. It's just people just not joining and people are just not doing it because of whatever system, the system, or just don't want to do it. And as a result, all of those things we're missing and don't have the people participating in is why I believe Cleveland is going down this spiral. And I'm glad you made that point, you said, because I think that's the start of trying. At least you got to, at least you, it seems like you got an understanding of it. One of my favorite movies is The Usual Suspects. Mm -hmm. And I never forget when they asked about Kaiser Soze. And yeah. they say the best trick that the devil ever played on mankind yeah. is to convince him that he doesn't he exist. exist. Yeah. Racism, our system are all in trouble. We cannot deny it. We cannot duck it. Our job is to not be to protect the system. Our job is to make the system work better for mm -hmm. our people. The challenge is that so many people have become disenchanted with the systems, mm -hmm. all of them, not just police, not just city hall, not just the county, but corporate community, other things, the extreme polarization that we're seeing now that people just can't seem to get along. The system is on trial right now. And we're in a very precarious time that we got to figure out if we're going to make the system work better or if people are going to try to just totally dismantle the system. And we just need to be careful with that because I will tell that sometimes you dismantle the system and it could turn out to be worse for people like you and me and for little kitties and little blains that we really are trying to protect. So I'm going to give you this as we close it out. We want to talk a little bit because this is a hot thing that's coming up and I may not get a chance to have you back on the show before it happened. It's that county jail. Yeah, moving to jail. And that was a big thing that was under the last administration. We had a last executive was working through that process and everyone to try to find a new location for the jail. And it appears now that they're looking at entertaining a place outside of Cleveland going into Garfield. And I wanted to get an opportunity to talk to you. I know you have, we had some discussions about that and what it means and the overall, again, back to what we talk about jobs and everything else leaving the city. What's you what's you guys doing over at council and how is council trying to figure out a way or are you guys thinking of trying to work with the county and trying to find another location to keep it here in Cleveland or at this point where you what's your thoughts on that? I spoke and testified to county council just before I came on this show today. Really? And I expressed my support, as I've always said, oh, for the jail to be in up. the city of Cleveland. <laughs> and the reason that I believe that the jail should be in the city of Cleveland is for a few reasons. Okay. One is we all want the jail to be more humane. Okay. The jail as it is right now is not humane. The first thing I think we need to do is to deal with the operations. We need to deal with cash bail, which is not a good thing. We need to deal with using the, the halfway houses and the transitional services that we don't utilize enough, that we need to do better of utilizing some of those kind of facilities. Mm -hmm. We need to do better than to just house people and hold people for an insurmountable period of time. But as you said earlier, and as we all know, there's some people doing some egregious things in the city. I remember when you worked at the prosecutor's office and you told me, Blaine, I can't believe some of the stuff I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. I look at brevity reports every day. And that man that raped that baby and that woman that left that baby mm -hmm. by himself wow. and that beat up his mother is got issues and need to be locked up. Okay. We need to give them all the help that they can. So need mm -hmm. to take them off of the streets because they are a danger to mm -hmm. people and a danger to themselves. So we need more humane facilities. I'll be the first to say that. Number two, taking right now, my statistics show that it's approximately 57.4 million that's being spent on personnel. Hmm. If you average that out to about 2.5%, 2, 2.5%, that's approximately 1.5 or 2 million off of our taxpayer rolls in hmm. the city of Cleveland. Hmm. Not to even count that these folks eat have vendors that come into the city, all of those different things. I also look at logistics for the families. The, fam the key way to get some of these folks back into society is to make sure that they have family support. 
Everybody does not have a car. In Cleveland, one out of four people don't have a car. Therefore, they have to rely on public transportation. So we need to make sure that the families have access. And the bar, the attorneys running back and forth between downtown is logistically challenging. Not to even mention where you get the law enforcement and how logistically it could take some of our law enforcement off of the streets. So I've asked for some of those questions to be answered before anything happens. But right now, I need the city to keep that facility for all of the reasons that we just talked about and more and others. But we definitely need to do better with reform so that we don't have as many people that we need to put into jail in the first place. I'm more for home confinement for some of the low level people that can make sure that we give them a bracelet and let them go home. Those are the kind of things that we need to think through in addition to just always being a one trick pony and talking about the jail. We need to think about it from a global perspective and how do we make sure that we use the diversion center, deal with cash bin mm -hmm. and all of those other things that I think is impacting the jail population right now. So the jail, from your perspective also, is still going to have the same challenges as, as that we talked about as it relates to trying to find uh, land that's big enough that can be assembled for us to be able to keep it here in the city of Cleveland, which will be the biggest obstacle in doing that as well. First of all, let me say this. Yes. But anywhere in Cleveland that you go, whether you go to the site of Transportation Road, whether you go out on That's Eddie correct. Boulevard, where we propose the site, Cheryl Stevens has done a great job of identifying other sites throughout the city of really? Cleveland. Okay. And she used to work for the County Land Bank and mm. now is working for the Akron Development Corporation. That's what she's doing. So there are sites here, but we might have some cleanup that's needed. And mm. let me say this, anywhere you build in the city of Cleveland has some remedial issues correct. with- Every um, last spot they pick has, yeah, I believe. Everything. So, yeah, everything. Even uh, when you go to Garfield, even though they're mm. saying clean land, mm -hmm. it's adjacent mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. methane gas. And let mm -hmm. me say this, there's a reason that Walmart and all those other different stores that they had out mm -hmm. there have vacated it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what all the reasons mm -hmm. are, but there's a reason that some of them have vacated it. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, we're part of the county too. Mm -hmm. So these are our taxpayer dollars and they're looking at paying about 40 million. Now, let me say this. I never back myself into a corner that mm -hmm. I can't have a conversation with the county sure. exec and county council mm -hmm. on doing what's best for the county. And if there's some kind of way that I see that Cleveland, that the jail is humane, that Cleveland is going to financially be okay, that we can make sure that the families and the logistics and those things are in place, and that we really think through how much time we're going to take officers, mm -hmm. sheriff's officers mm -hmm. off of the street, then I can be swayed, but I just need to understand the facts. And right now, nobody's really telling me how it makes sense to take 2,000 workers out of the central business district and will that harm the central business district? Is that an economic impact? And what does that mean to the city of Cleveland? So I need to understand some of those things and nobody's really talking about that. I'm a person that I read, I look at data and I try to make decisions based on facts, not my feelings all the time. How do you feel council feel as a whole about this? As a whole, most of council believes that it should be in the city of Cleveland. Most of council is backing this. We have passed resolutions. There were a couple of sites that we didn't think that it was the most appropriate place. But at the same time, there are several places in Cleveland that we believe can work. All right, Mr. Griffin, man, I appreciate you coming in on our program. I'm going to ask you my little closing questions. And after I ask these questions, I'm going to give you that camera to do your closing so that we can get out of here. Man, I thought you were going to talk about issue one, but that's cool. Oh, I'm going to let you close with issue one. That sounds like uh, yeah, I'm going to let you close with issue one. So I got a few questions I'd like to ask guests to get their opinion about just certain things about them. And the first question I ask, if there were a person you could trade places with for a day, who would it be? I'm going to go back in time. And this person is deceased now, but I'm a big reader of the Bible. Hmm. King Solomon is one of my favorite people. Jesus, wow. I always want to be the wisest, richest <laughs> person in the world and do some good with it. One of the things I always appreciate about him is even with his flaws, he was a person who was very generous. Mm -hmm. He was a person who understood complex issues, solved them, mm -hmm. and a person of tremendous wealth. And he is his bloodline and everything else has always been successful. So I'm a huge fan of King mm. Solomon. I know that came from out of nowhere, but you asked really? the question. Well, yeah, That's that, who that, I would that. trade places with. All right. If you, uh, what's your guilty pleasure that you will share with us? <laughs> Binge watching mm. the History Channel, mm. the Biography Channel, or the Story Channel. I love hearing people's story. I love hearing people's biography. And if you give me a Sunday afternoon that I can just sit back and watch for hours at a time, the History Channel, the Biography Channel, or the Story Channel. I'm a big history buff. I'm a big 
believer in reading other people's stories. What's the best compliment you ever got? How handsome I am, of course. Oh, really? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I, I'm joking, but not joking. But anyway, it's a great feeling when you get that house torn down next to that singer, mm -hmm. or you get a problem fixed for a resident that they couldn't get fixed for the last 20, 30, 40 years, or you mm -hmm. pass a law and people say, man, somebody really cares about us. The best compliments that I get is when people say that I actually care. I think it was Teddy Roosevelt or maybe even Benjamin Franklin that mm -hmm. said, nobody cares what you know unless they know that you care. When I get compliments that people really genuinely say that I cared about them and I showed and took the time to really try to address their issue or listen to them, even if they were irrational, I get pleasure out of that. Worst piece of advice you ever got? The worst piece of advice that I ever got is not, is to get a job and not a career. People always promote jobs, mm -hmm. but it took me a while to figure out that you're happiest when you have a career and a purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think that we give bad advice to people when we tell them, oh, just go get a job because you got people working jobs that they're miserable in. That's cool. uh, but getting somebody a career and a purpose in life, they will work hard and they will have so much production that you wouldn't be able to believe it. And last but not least, man, what never fails to make you smile? Oh, man, this grandbaby I have, man. I, when it, I was there, I knew you was going to say that. I was like, if you don't say that, oh, well, I, man. I, 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 that was the one when I said, uh, I, said I know you're going to say I'm in love, man, man with this little that, grandbaby man. named Layla Rose Griffin, right. man. And I'll be honest with you, I have a tough job. These mm -hmm. are tough jobs when you're a public servant. I tell people you get more FUs than thank yous. You get more challenges every day you wake up and people just download all of their problems. And it can be overwhelming at times. But when you, get to come home after a long day and hey, you got this pretty little girl, man, that I could just hold and make sure, man, that I help her get to sleep, feed her and everything else like that. And being a person that raised all boys, man, this little girl got my heart. That's cool. That's cool. Hey, man, again, I want to thank you for coming on our program, man. Whether we do like we always do around this time, we're going to let you have this camera here. Say a few words, man. Also, a quick reminder, if you wouldn't mind educating the folks about issue one on your way out with that on on your moment here so that we'll know what issue one is all about as well. And Blaine, take your time. You got that camera, brother. Absolutely. First of all, I always want to thank Ken Dow and for allowing me to come on this podcast to really deal with the people. And one of the things that I will tell you right now that is one of the most important things on our ballot in August the 8th is to vote no on issue one. Vote no on issue one. Teddy Roosevelt, in 1912, came to the convention in Ohio, and he came to the convention in Ohio in order to tell people why it was important to allow people to have a voice to be able to make amendments and to redress and address their government. And this has been on the books since 1912. This Republican legislature is now in the process of trying to undo that. You have three Republican governors, former governors, and you have several other Republicans, you have several business leaders, you have several Democrats that realize how dangerous this is. This is a preemptive strike. Issue one is a preemptive strike on abortion and choice and women's health. It's a preemptive strike on guns and responsible gun ownership. It's a preemptive strike on gerrymandering, which is why our state is one-sided and really not listening to all of the sides of the issue. It's a preemptive strike because it has 88 counties that would need signatures, which means a small county like Adams County can hold up an entire state whenever you go and submit petitions, just like we just seen with the abortion signatures that were contributed and the legalization of marijuana that was just put in. These are changes that citizens are able to do that will be rolled back by issue one. So I'm encouraging everybody to really vote against issue one and vote no on issue one. We are going to be really pushing hard. All the elected officials are all speaking in one voice. And this is a bipartisan thing because once again, you have a lot of other Republicans that are speaking out against this too. So it's not just a democratic issue. It's a civic issue in the state of Ohio. I encourage everybody once again, because this is so important that I say this, we lost too many people and too many lives, not just in Cleveland, but in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Texas, and other places across, across the United States of America. We have a gun problem, but more so we have a mental health problem. 
we have to do and be better. I know everybody is saying we want better laws and we want people to do better. But you know what? We as a society have to do better. If I can go to Ireland and they have hardly, if any, gun crime at all, an entire continent, I mean, an entire country that doesn't have any gun crime, then we got to start being able to think through how we can do that here as well. We got to be able to deal with the gun culture. And ladies and gentlemen, most important, I won't give up on Cleveland. I won't give up on you. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it because <laughs> I love Cleveland. I love Ward 6. And once again, I do love you. And at the end of the day, we're all going to make this place better because we got no place to go but up and continue to strive. Thank you. Everybody, that was Council President Blaine Griffin. You can reach and look into the description. We will leave links to all his information of where you can reach out to him at City Hall as well as his website and anything else. But until then, peace. Hey, everybody, this is Council President Blaine A. Griffin, better known as Griff. I'm asking you to check me out this Sunday on Strategic Moves with my man, Ken Dowd. I promise you won't regret it.